Johann Gottlieb Fichte, German, Johann Tully P. Function, May 19, 1762 to January 27, 1814, was a German philosopher who became a founding figure of the philosophical movement known as German idealism, which developed from the theoretical and ethical writings of Immanuel Kant. Recently, philosophers and scholars have begun to appreciate Fichte as an important philosopher in his own right due to his original insights into the nature of self consciousness or self awareness. Fichte was also the originator of thesis-antithesis synthesis, an idea that is often erroneously attributed to Hegel. Like Descartes and Kant before him, Fichte was motivated by the problem of subjectivity and consciousness. Fichte also wrote works of political philosophy, he has a reputation as one of the fathers of German nationalism. Biography <inaudible> 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 Fichte was born in Romanau, Upper Lusatia. The son of a ribbon weaver, he came of peasant stock which had lived in the region for many generations. The family was noted in the neighborhood for its probity and piety. Christian Fichte, Johann Gottlieb's father, married somewhat above his station. It has been suggested that a certain impatience which Fichte himself displayed throughout his life was an inheritance from his mother. Young Fichte received the rudiments of his education from his father. He showed remarkable ability from an early age, and it was owing to his reputation among the villagers that he gained the opportunity for a better education than he otherwise would have received. The story runs that the Freiherr von Militz, a country landowner, arrived too late to hear the local pastor preach. He was, however, informed that a lad in the neighborhood would be able to repeat the sermon practically verbatim. As a result, the baron took the lad into his protection, which meant that he paid his tuition. Early schooling Fichte was placed in the family of Pastor Krebel at Niederau near Meissen and there received thorough grounding in the classics. From this time onward, Fichte saw little of his parents. In October 1774, he was attending the celebrated foundation school at Pforta near Naumburg. This school is associated with the names of Novalis, August Wilhelm Schlegel, Friedrich Schlegel and Nietzsche. The spirit of the institution was semi-monastic and, while the education given was excellent in its way, it is doubtful whether there was enough social life and contact with the world for a pupil of Fichte's temperament and antecedents. Perhaps his education strengthened a tendency toward introspection and independence, characteristics which appear strongly in his doctrines and writings. Theological studies and private tutoring In 1780, he began study at the Theology Seminary of University of Jena. He was transferred a year later to study at the Leipzig University. Fichte seems to have supported himself at this period of bitter poverty and hard struggle. Freiherr von Militz continued to support him, but when he died in 1784, Fichte had to end his studies prematurely, without completing his degree. During the years 1784 to 1788, he supported himself in a precarious way as tutor in various Saxon families. In early 1788, he returned to Leipzig in the hope of finding a better employment, but eventually he had to settle for a much less promising position with the family of an innkeeper in Zurich. He lived in Zurich for the next two years 1788 to 1790, which was a time of great contentment for him. There he met his future wife, Johanna Rann, and Johann Heinrich Pestalozzi. There he also became in 1793 a member of the Freemasonry Lodge, Modestia cum Libertate, with which Johann Wolfgang Goethe was also connected. In the spring of 1790, he became engaged to Johanna. In the summer of 1790, Fichte began to study the works of Kant, but this occurred initially because one of his students wanted to know about them. They had a lasting effect on the trajectory of his life and thought. While he was assimilating the Kantian philosophy and preparing to develop it, fate dealt him a blow. The Rand family had suffered financial reverses, and his impending marriage had to be postponed. Topic. Kant From Zurich, Fichte returned to Leipzig in May 1790. In the spring of 1791, he obtained a tutorship at Warsaw in the house of a Polish nobleman. The situation, however, quickly proved disagreeable and he was released. He then got a chance to see Kant at Königsberg. 
After a disappointing interview on July 4 of the same year, he shut himself in his lodgings and threw all his energies into the composition of an essay which would compel Kant's attention and interest. This essay, completed in five weeks, was the Versuch einer Kritik aller Offenbarung, attempt at a critique of all revelation, 1792. In this book, according to Henrik, Fichte investigated the connections between divine revelation and Kant's critical philosophy. The first edition of the book was published without Kant or Fichte's knowledge, moreover without Fichte's name or signed preface. It was thus mistakenly thought to be a new work by Kant himself. Reviews were assuming Kant was the author when Kant cleared the confusion and openly praised the work and author. Fichte's reputation skyrocketed as many intellectuals of the day were of the opinion that it was the most shocking and astonishing news since nobody but Kant could have written this book. This amazing news of a third sun in the philosophical heavens has set me into such confusion." Karl Popper considers the book as essentially a fraud which though rather boring cleverly imitated Kant's style and that the rumors that Kant himself had written the book to be contrived. <laughs> Jena In October 1793, he was married in Zurich, where he remained the rest of the year. Stirred by the events and principles of the French Revolution, he wrote and anonymously published two pamphlets which led to him being seen as a devoted defender of liberty of thought and action and an advocate of political changes. In December of the same year, he received an invitation to fill the position of extraordinary professor of philosophy at the University of Jena. He accepted and began his lectures in May of the next year. With extraordinary zeal, he expounded his system of transcendental idealism. His success was immediate. He seems to have excelled as a lecturer because of the earnestness and force of his personality. These lectures were later published under the title The Vocation of the Scholar über die der He gave himself up to intense production, and a succession of works soon appeared. Atheism dispute After weathering a couple of academic storms, he was finally dismissed from Jena in 1799 as a result of a charge of atheism. He was accused of atheism in 1798 after publishing his essay, Über den Grund unsers Glaubens und eine Gottliche Weltregierung, on the ground of our belief in a divine world governance, which he had written in response to Friedrich Karl Forberg's essay, Development of the Concept of Religion, in his philosophical journal. For Fichte, God should be conceived primarily in moral terms. The living and efficaciously acting moral order is itself God. We require no other God, nor can we grasp any other. On the ground of our belief in a divine world governance. Fichte's intemperate appeal to the public. Appellation and das Publicum. 1799 provoked F. H. Jacobi to publish an open letter to Fichte, in which he equated philosophy in general and Fichte's transcendental philosophy in particular with nihilism. <inaudible> Berlin Since all the German states except Prussia had joined in the cry against him, he was forced to go to Berlin. There he associated himself with the Schlegels, Schleiermacher, Schelling and Tieck. In April 1800, through the introduction of Hungarian writer Ignaz Aurelius Fessler, he was initiated into Freemasonry in the Lodge Pythagoras of the Blazing Star where he was elected minor warden. At first Fichte was a warm admirer of Fessler, and was disposed to aid him in his proposed Masonic reform. But later he became Fessler's bitter opponent. Their controversy attracted much attention among Freemasons. Fichte presented two lectures on the philosophy of masonry during the same period as part of his work on the development of various higher degrees for the lodge in Berlin. A certain Johann Karl Christian Fischer, a high official of the Grand Orient, published those lectures in 1802-03 in two volumes under the title Philosophy of Freemasonry, Letters to Constant Philosophie der Morere. Brief and Constant, where Constant referred to a fictitious non Mason. In November 1800, Fichte published The Closed Commercial State, a philosophical sketch as an appendix to the doctrine of right and an example of a future politics. Der Handelstadt. 
Ein philosophischer Entwurf als Anhang zur Rechtsler und Probe einer Künftig zu liefernden Politik, a philosophical statement of his property theory, a historical analysis of European economic relations, and a political proposal for reforming them. In 1805, he was appointed to a professorship in Erlangen. The disaster at Jena in 1806, in which Napoleon completely crushed the Prussian army, drove him to Königsberg for a time, but he returned to Berlin in 1807 and continued his literary activity. The deplorable situation of Germany stirred him to the depths and led him to deliver the famous addresses to the German nation, Reden und die Deutsche Nation, 1808, which guided the uprising against Napoleon. He became a professor of the new university at Berlin founded in 1810. By the votes of his colleagues Fichte was unanimously elected its rector in the succeeding year. But, once more, his impetuosity and reforming zeal led to friction, and he resigned in 1812. The campaign against Napoleon began, and the hospitals at Berlin were soon full of patients. Fichte's wife devoted herself to nursing and caught a virulent fever. Just as she was recovering, he himself was stricken down. He died of typhus at the age of 51. His son, Emanuel Hermann Fichte, the 18th of July 1796 to the 8th of August 1879, also made contributions to philosophy. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Philosophical work. In mimicking Kant's difficult style, his critics argued that Fichte produced works that were barely intelligible. He made no hesitation in pluming himself on his great skill in the shadowy and obscure, by often remarking to his pupils, that there was only one man in the world who could fully understand his writings, and even he was often at a loss to seize upon his real meaning." On the other hand, Fichte himself acknowledged the difficulty of his writings, but argued that his works were clear and transparent to those who made the effort to think without preconceptions and prejudices. Fichte did not endorse Kant's argument for the existence of noumena, of things in themselves, the supra-sensible reality beyond the categories of direct human perception. Fichte saw the rigorous and systematic separation of things in themselves, noumena, and things as they appear to us, phenomena, as an invitation to skepticism. Rather than invite such skepticism, Fichte made the radical suggestion that we should throw out the notion of a noumenal world and instead accept the fact that consciousness does not have a grounding in a so-called real world. In fact, Fichte achieved fame for originating the argument that consciousness is not grounded in anything outside of itself. The phenomenal world as such, arises from self-consciousness, the activity of the ego, and moral awareness. His student and critic, Arthur Schopenhauer, wrote, Fichte who, because the thing in itself had just been discredited, at once prepared a system without any thing in itself. Consequently, he rejected the assumption of anything that was not through and through merely our representation, and therefore let the knowing subject be all in all or at any rate produce everything from its own resources. For this purpose, he at once did away with the essential and most meritorious part of the Kantian doctrine, the distinction between a priori and a posteriori and thus that between the phenomenon and the thing in itself. For he declared everything to be a priori, naturally without any evidence for such a monstrous assertion. Instead of these, he gave sophisms and even crazy sham demonstrations whose absurdity was concealed under the mask of profundity and of the incomprehensibility ostensibly arising therefrom. Moreover, he appealed boldly and openly to intellectual intuition, that is, really to inspiration. Soren Kierkegaard was also a student of the writings of Fichte. Our whole age is imbued with a formal striving. This is what led us to disregard congeniality and to emphasize symmetrical beauty, to prefer conventional rather than sincere social relations. It is this whole striving which is denoted by, to use the words of another author, Fichte's and the other philosophers' attempts to construct systems by sharpness of mind and Robespierre's attempt to do it with the help of the guillotine, it is this which meets us in the flowing butterfly verses of our poets and in Auber's music, and finally, it is this which produces the many revolutions in the political world. I agree perfectly with this whole effort to cling to form, insofar as it continues to be the medium through which we have the idea, but it should not be forgotten that it is the idea which should determine the form, not the form which determines the idea. We should keep in mind that life is not something abstract but something extremely individual. We should not forget that, for example, from a poetic genius position of immediacy, form is nothing but the coming into existence of the idea in the world, and that the task of reflection is only to investigate whether or not the idea has gotten the properly corresponding form. 
Form is not the basis of life, but life is the basis of form. Imagine that a man long infatuated with the Greek mode of life had acquired the means to arrange for a building in the Greek style and a Grecian household establishment. Whether or not he would be satisfied would be highly problematical, or would he soon prefer another form simply because he had not sufficiently tested himself and the system in which he lived. But just as a leap backward is wrong something the age, on the whole, is inclined to acknowledge, so also a leap forward is wrong. Both of them because a natural development does not proceed by leaps, and life's earnestness will ironize over every such experiment, even if it succeeds momentarily. Topic. Central theory In his work Foundations of Natural Right 1797, Fichte argued that self-consciousness was a social phenomenon, an important step and perhaps the first clear step taken in this direction by modern philosophy. A necessary condition of every subject's self-awareness, for Fichte, is the existence of other rational subjects. These others call or summon, Fordernauf, the subject or self out of its unconsciousness and into an awareness of itself as a free individual. Fichte's account proceeds from the general principle that the I das ich must posit itself as an individual in order to posit setzen itself at all, and that in order to posit itself as an individual it must recognize itself as it were to a calling or summons by other free individuals called, moreover, to limit its own freedom out of respect for the freedom of the other. The same condition applied and applies, of course, to the others in its development. Hence, mutual recognition of rational individuals turns out to be a condition necessary for the individual I in general. This argument for intersubjectivity is central to the conception of selfhood developed in the foundations of the science of knowledge Grundlage der Gesamten Wissenschaftsler, 1794-1795. In Fichte's view consciousness of the self depends upon resistance or a check by something that is understood as not part of the self yet is not immediately ascribable to a particular sensory perception. In his later 1796-1799 lectures, his Nova Methodo, Fichte incorporated it into his revised presentation of the very foundations of his system, where the summons takes its place alongside original feeling, which takes the place of the earlier anstos see below, as both a limit upon the absolute freedom of the I and a condition for the positing of the same. The I itself posits this situation for itself. To posit does not mean to create the objects of consciousness. The principle in question simply states that the essence of an I lies in the assertion of one's own self-identity, i.e., that consciousness presupposes self-consciousness. Such immediate self-identity, however, cannot be understood as a psychological fact, nor as an act or accident of some previously existing substance or being. It is an action of the I, but one that is identical with the very existence of this same I. In Fichte's technical terminology, the original unity of self-consciousness is to be understood both as an action and as the product of the same I, as a fact and or act. Thothandlung, modern German, Tathandlung, a unity that is presupposed by and contained within every fact and every act of empirical consciousness, although it never appears as such therein. The I must posit itself in order to be an I at all, but it can posit itself only insofar as it posits itself as limited. Moreover, it cannot even posit for itself its own limitations, in the sense of producing or creating these limits. The finite I cannot be the ground of its own passivity. Instead, for Fichte, if the I is to posit itself off at all, it must simply discover itself to be limited, a discovery that Fichte characterizes as an impulse, repulse, or resistance. Anstos, modern German, ansto, to the free practical activity of the I. Such an original limitation of the I is, however, a limit for the I only insofar as the I posits it out as a limit. The I does this, according to Fichte's analysis, by positing its own limitation, first, as only a feeling, then as a sensation, then as an intuition of a thing, and finally as a summons of another person. The anstos thus provides the essential impetus that first posits in motion the entire complex train of activities that finally result in our conscious experience both of ourselves and others as empirical individuals and of the world around us. Though anstos plays a similar role as the thing in itself does in Kantian philosophy, unlike Kant, Fichte's anstos is not something foreign to the I instead, it denotes the original encounter of the I with its own finitude. Rather than claim that the not-I is the cause or ground of the anstos, Fichte argues that not-I is posited by the I precisely in order to explain to itself the anstos, that is, in order to become conscious of anstos. 
Though the Wissenschaftsler demonstrates that such an anstos must occur if self-consciousness is to come about, it is quite unable to deduce or to explain the actual occurrence of such an anstos, except as a condition for the possibility of consciousness. Accordingly, there are strict limits to what can be expected from any a priori deduction of experience, and this limitation, for Fichte, equally applies to Kant's transcendental philosophy. According to Fichte, transcendental philosophy can explain that the world must have space, time, and causality, but it can never explain why objects have the particular sensible properties they happen to have or why I am this determinate individual rather than another. This is something that the I simply has to discover at the same time that it discovers its own freedom, and indeed, as a condition for the latter. Dieter Henrik proposed that Fichte was able to move beyond a reflective theory of consciousness. According to Fichte, the self must already have some prior acquaintance with itself, independent of the act of reflection. No object comes to consciousness except under the condition that I am aware of myself, the conscious subject. Jedes object K O M M T zoom bewust sein lediglich unter der Bedingung, das ich auch meiner selb, de bewusstseinden subjects mir bewusst say. This idea is what Henrik called Fichte's original insight. Topic: Other works. Fichte also developed a theory of the state based on the idea of self-sufficiency. In his mind, the state should control international relations, the value of money, and remain an autarky. Because of this necessity to have relations with other rational beings in order to achieve consciousness, Fichte writes that there must be a relation of right, in which there is a mutual recognition of rationality by both parties. Topic. Nationalism. Between December 1807 and March 1808, Fichte gave a series of lectures concerning the German nation and its culture and language, projecting the kind of national education he hoped would raise it from the humiliation of its defeat at the hands of the French. Having been a supporter of revolutionary France, Fichte became disenchanted by 1804 as Napoleon's armies advanced through Europe, occupying German territories, stripping them of their raw materials and subjugating them to foreign rule. Consequently, Fichte came to believe Germany would be responsible to carry the virtues of the French Revolution into the future. Furthermore, his nationalism was not aroused by Prussian military defeat and humiliation, for these had not yet occurred, but resulted from devotion to his own humanitarian philosophy. Through disappointment in the French he turned to the German nation as the instrument of fulfilling it. These lectures, entitled The Addresses to the German Nation, coincided with a period of reform in the Prussian government, under the chancellorship of Baron V. O. M. Stein. The addresses display Fichte's interest during that period in language and culture as vehicles of human spiritual development. Fichte built upon the earlier ideas of Johann Gottfried Herder and attempted to unite them with his more systematic approach. The aim of the German nation, according to Fichte, was to found an empire of spirit and reason, and to annihilate completely the crude physical force that rules of the world." Like Herder's German nationalism, Fichte's was wholly cultural, and grounded in the aesthetic, literary, and moral. The nationalism propounded by Fichte in the addresses would be appealed to over a century later by the Nazi party in Germany, which sought in Fichte a forerunner to its own nationalist ideology. Like Nietzsche, the association of Fichte with the Nazi regime came to color readings of Fichte's German nationalism in the post-war period. This reading of Fichte was often bolstered through reference to an unpublished letter from 1793, Contributions to the Correction of the Public's Judgment Concerning the French Revolution, wherein Fichte expressed anti-Semitic sentiments, such as arguing against extending civil rights to Jews and calling them a state within a state that could undermine the German nation. However, attached to the letter is a footnote in which Fichte provides an impassioned plea for permitting Jews to practice their religion without hindrance. Furthermore, the final act of Fichte's academic career was to resign as rector of Humboldt University in protest when his colleagues refused to punish the harassment of Jewish students. While recent scholarship has sought to dissociate Fichte's writings on nationalism with his adoption by the Nazi party, the association continues to blight his legacy, although Fichte, as if to exclude all ground of doubt, clearly and distinctly prohibits in his reworked version of The Science of Ethics as Based on the Science of Knowledge, see section Final Period in Berlin genocide and other crimes against humanity. 
If you say that it is your conscience's command to exterminate peoples for their sins, we can confidently tell you that you are wrong, for such things can never be commanded against the free and moral force. Topic. Women Fichte argued that, "...active citizenship, civic freedom and even property rights should be withheld from women, whose calling was to subject themselves utterly to the authority of their fathers and husbands." Topic. Final period in Berlin Fichte gave a wide range of public and private lectures in Berlin from the last decade of his life. These form some of his best known work, and are the basis of a revived German speaking scholarly interest in his work. The lectures include two works from 1806. In The Characteristics of the Present Age, Die Grundsuch des Gegenwartigen Zeitalters, Fichte outlines his theory of different historical and cultural epochs. His mystic work The Way Towards the Blessed Life gave his fullest thoughts on religion. In 1808 he gave a series of speeches in French-occupied Berlin, addresses to the German nation. In 1810, the new University of Berlin was set up, designed along lines put forward by Wilhelm von Humboldt. Fichte was made its rector and also the first chair of philosophy. This was in part because of educational themes in the addresses, and in part because of his earlier work at Jena University. Fichte lectured on further versions of his Wissenschaftsler. Of these, he only published a brief work from 1810, The Science of Knowledge in its General Outline Die Wissenschaftsler, in Irem Allgemeinen Umris Dargestelt, also translated as Outline of the Doctrine of Knowledge. His son published some of these thirty years after his death. Most only became public in the last decades of the 20th century, in his collected works. This included reworked versions of the Doctrine of Science Wissenschaftsler, 1810-1813, the Science of Rights Das System der Rechtsler, 1812, and the Science of Ethics as based on the Science of Knowledge Das System der Sittenlehre nach den Principien der Wissenschaftsler, 1812, 1st ed., 1798. Bibliography Topic. Selected works in German Topic. Wissenschaftsler Über den Begriff der Wissenschaftsler oder der Sogenannten Philosophie 1794. Grundlage der Gesamten Wissenschaftsler 1794-1795 Wissenschaftsler Nova Methodo, 1796 to 1799; Halley Nachschrift, 1796–1797; and Krause Nachschrift, 1798–1799; Versuch einer neuen Darstellung der Wissenschaftsler, 1797–1798; Darstellung der Wissenschaftsler, 1801. Die Wissenschaftsler, 1804, 1812, 1813. Die Wissenschaftsler, in Irem Allgemeinen Umris Dargestelt Other works in German Versuch einer Kritik aller Offenbarung Betrag zur Berichtigung der Urteil des Publikums über die Französische Revolution Einige Vorlesungen über die Bestimmung des Gelehrten Grundlage des Naturrechts 1796 Das System der Sittenlehre nach den Principien der Wissenschaftsler 1798 Über den Grund unsers Glaubens und eine gottliche Weltregierung 1798 Appellation und das Publikum über die Deutsche Schürf Sachs Confiscationsrescript IHM Beigemessen und Atheistischen Auerungen Eine Schrift, die man zu lesen bittet, ehe man sei confessert. 1799 Der Geschlossen Handelstadt. Ein philosophischer Entwurf als Anhang zur Rechtsler und Probe einer Kunnaftig zu Leifernden Politik 1800. Die Bestimmung des Menschen 1800. Friedrich Nicolai Leben und Sonderbare Meinungen 1801. Philosophie der Morere. Brief and Constant 1802, Die Grundsuche des Gegenwartigen Zeitalters 1806, 
Die Anweisung zum Seligen Leben oder Ach die Religionsler 1806. Reden und die Deutsche Nation 1807-1808. Das System der Rechtsler 1812. Topic. Correspondence. Jacobi and Fichte, German text, 1799–1816, with introduction and critical apparatus by Marco Avaldo and Eriberto Acerba. Introduction, German text, Italian translation, three appendices with Jacobi's and Fichte's complementary texts, philological notes, commentary, bibliography, index. Istituto Italiano per Gli Studi Filosofici Press, Naples, 2011. ISBN 978-88-905957-5. Two. Topic collected works in German The new standard edition of Fichte's works in German, which supersedes all previous editions, is the Gesamtausgabe collected works or complete edition, commonly abbreviated as GA, prepared by the Bavarian Academy of Sciences, Gesamtausgabe der Bayerischen Akademie der Wissenschaften, 42 volumes, edited by Reinhard Loth, Hans Glivitzky, Eric Fuchs and Peter Schneider, Stuttgart Bad Cannstatt, Frohmann Holzburg, 1962-2012. It is organized into four parts, Part 1, Published Works Part 2, Unpublished Writings Part 3, Correspondence Part 4, Lecture Transcripts Fichte's works are quoted and cited from Ga, followed by a combination of Roman and Arabic numbers, indicating the series and volume, respectively, and the page numbers. Another edition is Johann Gottlieb Fichte's Samtliche Work a brief. SW, ed. I. H. Fichte. Berlin, de Greiter, 1971. Topic selected works in English concerning the conception of the science of knowledge generally Über den Begriff der Wissenschaftsler oder der Sogenannten Philosophie, 1794, translated by Adolf Ernst Kroger. In the Science of Knowledge, pp. 331-336. Philadelphia, J. B. Lippincott & Co., 1868. R. P. T., London, Trubner & Co., 1889. Attempt at a Critique of All Revelation. Trans. Garrett Green. New York, Cambridge University Press, 1978. Translation of Versuch einer Kritik aller Offenbarung, 1st ed., 1792, 2nd ed., 1793, Early Philosophical Writings. Trans. and ed. Daniel Brazil. Ithaca, Cornell University Press, 1988. Contains selections from Fichte's writings and correspondence from the Jena period, 1794-1799. Foundations of the Entire Science of Knowledge. Translation of, Grundlage der Gesamten Wissenschaftsler 1794 2nd ed., 1802, Fichte's first major exposition of the Wissenschaftler. In, Heath, Peter, Lax, John, eds., 1982. The Science of Knowledge. With the first and second introductions reissued, first published by Meredith Corporation 1970. Texts in German Philosophy. Translated by Heath, Peter, Lax, John. Cambridge University Press. ISBN 978-0-521-27050-2. Foundations of Natural Right. Trans. Michael Bauer. Ed. Frederick Neuhauser. Cambridge, Cambridge University Press, 2000. Translation of Grundlage des Naturrechts, 1796-97, Foundations of Transcendental Philosophy Wissenschaftsler Nova Methodo FTP. Trans, and ed. Daniel Brazil. Ithaca, N.Y., Cornell University Press, 1992. Translation of Wissenschaftsler Nova Methodo, 1796-1799, The System of Ethics According to the Principles of the Wissenschaftsler Translation of Das System der Sittenlehre nach den Principien der Wissenschaftsler, 1798. Ed. and Trans. Daniel Brazil and Gunter Zoller. Cambridge University Press, 2005. Introductions to the Wissenschaftsler and Other Writings. Trans. and Ed. Daniel Brazil. Indianapolis, and Cambridge, Hackett, 1994. Contains mostly writings from the late Jena period, 1797-1799, The Vocation of Man, 1848. Trans. Peter Preuss. Indianapolis, translation of Die Bestimmung des Menschen, 1800, The Vocation of the Scholar, 1847. Translation of Einige Vorlesungen über die Bestimmung des Gelehrten, 1794, a crystal clear report to the general public concerning the actual essence of the newest philosophy, an attempt to force the reader to understand. Trans. John Botterman and William Rash. 
in Philosophy of German Idealism, pp. 39–115, translation of Sonnenklärer Bericht und das Grosser Publikum über das Wesen der Neusten Philosophie, 1801, The Science of Knowing, J.G. Fichte's 1804 Lectures on the Wissenschaftsler with an introduction by the translator and a German-English glossary. Sunni series in contemporary continental philosophy. Translated by Wright, Walter E. Albany, New York, State University of New York Press, 2005. ISBN 978-0-7914-6449-6. Outline of the Doctrine of Knowledge, 1810 Translation of Die Wissenschaftsler, in Irem Allgemeinen Umris Dargestelt published in from the popular works of Johann Gottlieb Fichte, Trubner & Co., 1889, trans. William Smith, on the Nature of the Scholar, 1845 Translation of Uber das Wesen des Gelehrten, 1806 Characteristics of the Present Age Die Grundsuche des Gegenwartigen Zetalters, 1806. In, The Popular Works of Johann Gottlieb Fichte, Two Vols, Trans, and ed. William Smith. London, Chapman, 1848-49. Reprint, London, Thomes Press, 1999. Addresses to the German Nation, Redden and Die Deutsche Nation, 1808, ed. and trans. Gregory Moore. Cambridge University Press, 2008. The Philosophical Rupture Between Fichte and Schelling, Selected Texts and Correspondence, 1800-1802. Trans. and eds. Michael G. Vader and David W. Wood. Albany, New York, State University of New York Press, 2012. Includes the following texts by Johann Gottlieb Fichte, Correspondence with F. W. J. Schelling 1800-1802, Announcement, 1800, Extract from, New Version of the Wissenschaftsler, 1800, Commentaries on Schelling's System of Transcendental Idealism and Presentation of My System of Philosophy, 1800-1801. Works online in English J. G. Fichte. The Wissenschaftsler as Mathematics. Announcement. 1800-1801. Asterisk 1. Addresses to the German Nation. 1922. Trs. R. F. Jones and G. H. Turnbull, Ia. Uteronto. The Destination of Man. 1846. Alternative Translation of the Vocation of Man. Tr. Mrs. Percy Sinnott, Ia, Uteranto. Doctrine de la Science, Paris, 1843. French translation of Foundations of the Entire Science of Knowledge. Google, Harvard, Google, Oxford, Google, Umish in French. Johann Gottlieb Fichte's Popular Works, 1873. Tr. William Smith, Ia, Uteranto. New Exposition of the Science of Knowledge, 1869. Translation of Versuch einer neuen Darstellung der Wissenschaftsler, T.R. A. E. Kroger, Google, Harvard, Google, NYPL, IA, Uteranto. On the Nature of the Scholar, 1845. Alternative translation of the Vocation of the Scholar, T.R. William Smith, IA, Uteranto. The Popular Works of Johann Gottlieb Fichte, 1848 49, T.R. William Smith. Volume 1, 1848. Google Oxford IA Uteranto 4th ed 1889 IA Illinois IA Uteranto Volume 2 1849 IA Uteranto 4th ed 1889 Google Stanford IA Illinois IA Uteranto The Science of Ethics is Based on the Science of Knowledge 1897 TR AE Kroger Google Umish IA Uteranto The Science of Knowledge 1889 Alternative translation of Foundations of the Entire Science of Knowledge, T.R. A. E. Kroger, Ia, Uteranto. The Science of Rights, 1889, T.R. A. E. Kroger. Ia, Ukal. German, Versuch einer Kritik aller Offenbarung, Konigsberg, 1792, 2nd ed., 1793. Gallica Google, Oxford, Google, Oxford. The Vocation of Man, 1848, T.R. William Smith, Google, Oxford, 1910. Google, UCAL. The Vocation of the Scholar, 1847, TR. William Smith, IA, UCAL. 
The Way Towards the Blessed Life 1849, T.R. William Smith, Google Oxford. On the Foundation of Our Belief in a Divine Government of the Universe. Alternative translation of On the Ground of Our Belief in a Divine World Governance. Trans. Anon. N. D. Topic. Notes Topic. References Daniel Brazil. Fichte's Inicitimus Review and the Transformation of German Idealism. The Review of Metaphysics, 34 545–68. Daniel Brazil and Tom Rockmore eds. Fichte, Historical Contexts, Contemporary Controversies. Atlantic Highlands, Humanities Press, 1994. Daniel Brazil and Tom Rockmore, eds. Fichte, German Idealism, and Early Romanticism, Rodopi, 2010. Daniel Brazil. Thinking through the Wissenschaftsler, Themes from Fichte's Early Philosophy. Oxford, Oxford University Press, 2013. Ezekiel L. Pozizorski. Between Reinhold and Fichte, August Ludwig Holson's Contribution to the Emergence of German Idealism. Karlsruhe, Karlsruher Institute für Technologie, 2012. Sally Sedgwick. The Reception of Kant's Critical Philosophy, Fichte, Schelling, and Hegel. Cambridge, Cambridge University Press, 2007. Violetta L. Weibel, Daniel Brazil, Tom Rockmore eds, Fichte and the Phenomenological Tradition, Berlin, Walter de Gruyter, 2010. Gunter Zoller. Fichte's Transcendental Philosophy, The Original Duplicity of Intelligence and Will. Cambridge, Cambridge University Press, 1998. Topic. Further reading Karl Emmerich's, Dieter Sturma eds, The Modern Subject, Conceptions of the Self in Classical German Philosophy, Sunni Press, 1995. Arash Abizadeh. Was Fichte an ethnic nationalist? History of Political Thought 26.2 334-359. Gunnar Beck. Fichte and Kant on Freedom, Rights and Law, Lexington Books, Roman and Littlefield, 2008. Franks, Paul. All or Nothing, Systematicity, Transcendental Arguments, and Skepticism in German Idealism, Cambridge, Harvard University Press, 2005. T. P. Holler. Imagination and Reflection, Intersubjectivity. Fichte's Grundlage of 1794. The Hague, Nyhoff, 1982. Wayne Martin. Idealism and Objectivity, Understanding Fichte's Jena Project. Stanford, Stanford University Press, 1997. Fichte, 1, Johann Gottlieb, Article in, Myers Conversations Lexicon, 4. AUFL, 1888-1890, BD, 6, S 234F. Harold Munster. Fichte trifft Darwin, Lummen und Derrida, die Bestimmung des Menschen in Differenztheoretischer Reconstruction und im Kontext der Wissenschaftsler Nova Methodo Fichte meets Darwin, Lummen and Derrida. The vocation of man, as reconstructed by theories of difference and in the context of the Wissenschaftsler Nova Methodo. Amsterdam, New York, Rodopi, 2011 Fichte Studien Supplementa, Vol. 28. Frederick Neuhauser. Fichte's Theory of Subjectivity. Cambridge, Cambridge University Press, 1990. Tom Rockmore. Fichte, Marx, and the German Philosophical Tradition. Carbondale, Southern Illinois University Press, 1980. Rainer Schaefer. Johann Gottlieb Fichte's Grundlage der Gesamten Wissenschaftsler von 1794. Darmstadt, Wissenschaftliche Buchgesellschaft, 2006. Ulrich Schwab. Individuals und Transindividuals ich. Die Selbindividuation Reiner Subjektivität und Fichtes. Wissenschaftsler Nova Methodo. Paderborn 2007. Peter Suber. A Case Study in Ad Hominem Arguments, Fichtes Science of Knowledge. Philosophy and Rhetoric, 23, 1, 1990, 12-42. Xavier Tilliot, Fichte. La science de la liberté, pref, by Reinhard Loth, VRIN, 2003. Robert R. Williams. Recognition, Fichte and Hegel on the other. Albany, State University of New York Press, 1992. David W. Wood. 
Mathesis of the Mind, a study of Fichte's Wissenschaftsler and Geometry. Amsterdam, New York, Rodopi, 2012 Fichte Studien Supplementa, Vol. 29. Tommaso Valentini, I Fondamenti della Liberta in J.G. Fichte. Studi sul primato del pratico, Presentazioni di Armando Rigabello, Editori Rioniti University Press, Roma 2012. Topic. External links Works by Johann Gottlieb Fichte at Project Gutenberg Works by or about Johann Gottlieb Fichte at Internet Archive Works by Johann Gottlieb Fichte at LibriVox Public Domain Audiobooks Outlines of the Doctrine of Knowledge Zalta, Edward N. ed. Johann Gottlieb Fichte. Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. The North American Fichte Society, Fichte's Works in English Translation Works by Fichte, Original German Texts International Johann Gottlieb Fichte Gesellschaft Kultur and Kongresswerk Fichte, Event Location in Magdeburg, named after Johann Gottlieb Fichte A Case Study in Ad Hominem Arguments, Fichte's Science of Knowledge. <laughs>